Okay, so I started with a definition here from the World Health Organization. And they say it's a syndrome conceptualized as resulting from chronic workplace stress. Now, I want to point out to you, it says chronic workplace. Um, it's, it, it is about, it is an occupational term, burnout syndrome. It, it's not meant really for other uses in a technical sense. Um, so it's, it's a chronic, what's a syndrome conceptualized as a chronic workplace um, stress that hasn't been successfully managed. In some ways, um, that seems blaming of the employee, and we'll talk more about that later. But it has three main areas that you have to look at the symptoms in. Um, one is just that, that sense of exhaustion. Now, you know, how many folks have felt exhaustion over this pandemic? Uh, probably most of us. Um, the second dimension is really increased mental distance towards one's job, like feeling disconnected. But mostly I see more of the um, being negative towards one's job more than just feeling distant. Uh, the last place is just um, reduced professional um, efficacy. Um, really, people are feeling a lot less effective. And that's if you ask the employee, like not their supervisor. So really, overall, exhaustion, um, negative towards job, um, feeling ineffective, and like you're really not making any progress and you're losing some meaning. Um, I hope that gives people the start. I have another definition here um, that comes from the American Thoracic Society. Um, it, they talk about it being a work-related constellation of symptoms that occur in individuals without a prior history of psychological or psychiatric disorders. And I, again, I, I stress that piece. Um, burnout syndrome is not a psychological or psychiatric disorder. Um, they claim it's frequently triggered by a discrepancy between the expectations and ideals of the employee and the requirements of their position. Uh, my best example here is probably um, substance use disorder treatment counselors and mental health therapists. They go to school to come help people, right? But what happens is, is they get out in the field and they're helping people, but there's also like, you know, 900 sheets of paper to do with every session they provide. So folks that are in the field to help people can get discouraged at the actual requirements of their position. Um, according to this definition, people will feel increased stress levels and disillusionment with their, with their employment. Amy, are there any questions coming up so far? So we're just saying it's a work-related issue that people's occupation really isn't meeting their expectations and they're suffering some somewhat negative um, responses to that. No questions yet, Bob. Okay. So just some, some basic information about burnout syndrome I thought was valuable to share today. It was actually the term came from a Herbert Freudenberger in 1974. He wrote a book on it and uh, he's the one that coined the term. So that's, that's kind of when it all started. Now I wanna stress that burnout is not a, a recognized mental disorder. It's, it's again, it's um, more of a syndrome or um, life-related issue. And in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders that we use for diagnosing people with mental disorders, um, it's not recognized. So keep that in your mind. It's not considered a, a mental health disorder. The other piece to look at is what the medical profession uses, and that's the International Classification of Diseases, or ICD. Um, the latest version does have burnout in it, but they list it as a Z code, and that means it has clinical significance, but it's not, it's not a disease or disorder. And what do they say here? Non-medical life management difficulty. 
So they're admitting that there's, there's um, some clinical relevance to it, but it's not classified as a disease or disorder. And that's the important distinction I want to put out. I mean, burnout syndrome is not a mental health disease and it's not a physical disease. It's, it's a syndrome or condition that's, that's relevant, but doesn't take it to, to that level. Um, burnout is not equal to depression, although some of the symptoms are shared. If you look at, at the symptoms of, of burnout, they do, a few of them line up with, um, say, major depression in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. But um, it's, it, it's only a couple of the criteria out of six. And so burnout has some relationship to depression, but it isn't clear how much. I don't know how much uh, folks have heard about like learned helplessness. Um, that was the study done by Pavlov on, on dogs and that animals and, and human beings, if they're put in situations where they lack choices and control and they're gonna receive an as, a, aversive stimuli tend to have learned helplessness responses. And that's where people feel helpless and hopeless and out of control. And there's an element of this here in burnout syndrome. I mean, you feel like, like what you're doing isn't meaningful and you, you're not accomplishing things. So I do wanna throw that out there. There is a piece of, of learned helplessness that's part of burnout syndrome. Chances are, if you're feeling in control and that things are going well, obviously you're not gonna experience burnout syndrome. Okay, so that's kind of the things that we need to know about what is burnout syndrome, um, what it isn't. And now we're gonna uh, delve into the symptoms and what that looks like. And so I've broken this up into multiple categories. Uh, the first one here is uh, the physical signs and symptoms of burnout. So in our first definition with the World Health Organization, um, feeling tired or drained most of the time. Uh, you frequently see this where, you know, people are going to bed much earlier than they were, um, trying to sleep more. Um, they're always exhausted at work. Um, part of that is not feeling motivated to do various tasks, um, especially things that, that repeating the same task over and over again gets extremely difficult when you feel this, this drained and exhausted. Uh, the next piece is really um, more frequent illnesses from lowered immunity. So burnout syndrome does truly impact, impact us um, physically uh, because it lowers the, the immune system, it weakens it. Um, there's a lot of studies out that show that when we're under a great deal of stress for too long a period of time, that, that there's a response in our white blood cells and we have less T lymphocyte killer cells available to fight off foreign objects. Um, so obviously if you are discouraged with your job, feeling unimportant, feeling trapped, um, and you stay in that state for a period of time, there is a physical impact on your body and your ability to fight off illness. You know, that's a stress response. So real important to realize that, that that is a physical stress response of being in the situation. Uh, next symptom is frequent headaches or muscle pain. Uh, the next time your coworker says, man, I'm having headaches like crazy. Um, yeah, you might show them this video um, because frequent headaches can be a lot of different medical problems, but is definitely a sign um, or symptom of burnout. Uh, the last one under physical is a change in appetite or sleep habits. Now the change in appetite, it, it isn't real clear because it can go either way. People can start eating more to cope and to deal with some of that learned helplessness or they can lose their appetite and lose weight because they're stressed out and they don't feel like, like eating. Um, with sleep habits, it usually shows up two ways. The first 
is that people can't fall asleep. That's usually a sign of some adrenaline um, from the stress response uh, in people's bodies. And so they struggle to shut their mind down and fall asleep. Uh, the other way that the sleep issues show up is that they wake up at three o'clock in the morning or four o'clock in the morning worrying about things at work. Um, obviously, for all of you, that's that's a bad sign when when that's happening to you. Amy, do we have any questions or comments at this point? Nope, nothing yet. OK. Um, and please feel free to ask questions or comments. It's hard to direct this without any feedback. So they're encouraged. OK, moving on to um, emotional signs and symptoms of burnout. So this is where people um, feel like a failure. Um, they start to, to doubt themselves and their capability and their value. Um, left long enough, people can get really discouraged and it does greatly uh, impact their effectiveness. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy of doom. You know, you feel bad. You don't feel like, like it matters that you're getting anywhere. People don't care. And you kind of stop doing things. And um, you get that whole sense of failure and self-doubt that actually does reduce your performance. So again, we've already mentioned it in the definitions, but people feel helpless. They feel trapped and defeated. Um, they, they definitely um, start daydreaming about other things um, to meet their needs. Um, oftentimes a change in occupation can be a frequent one. Um, I joke with uh, the staff at Great Lakes that 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 my fantasy is to sell tractors. I have I have no experience with tractors, no training in tractors, but it just it sounds like this concrete item that's different than what I've done for the last thirty seven years. So there's there's my own um, fantasy that helps me escape the everyday things. Another symptom is detachment, I'm feeling alone in the world. Uh, again, people tend to isolate, they're stressed, um, they're actually doing the opposite of what they need to do, and we'll talk more about that in the scope and the co coping skills. Um, the loss of motivation, you know, if you're not getting anywhere and it's all hopeless, why show up? Why get things done? Why do extra projects? And again, people get a negative outlook. Um, Supervisors go, wow, that person's negative, or wow, they're poisonous to our culture. And, and really, the person may not even recognize how negative they are. So very important to take a look at that negative outlook on your job. Um, and the last one on the slide is the decreased satisfaction and sense of accomplishment. And this one is tricky because it's about people's own perspectives and their own interpretations. I mean, there are people that can be pretty burned out that are still doing very well in accomplishing things, but they, they themselves feel bad about it. They don't feel that they're up to what they were doing and that it matters. So uh, definitely important to get feedback from the people around you and to not, um, not go too far into that um, lack of accomplishment. Okay, behavioral signs and symptoms of burnout. So you'll see people withdraw from responsibilities. Um, and that can be both at work and at home, even though burnout syndrome is, is not mainly about your home life, but people can, can feel overwhelmed and, and defeated and just stop doing some of those other responsibilities. So if you take a look at your own behavior, I mean, there's withdrawing from responsibilities at work and also withdrawing from responsibilities at home. Isolating yourself from others, that's somewhat covered on the previous slide, but um, again, when people get stressed and feel negative, they, they tend to isolate, which can make things worse because you're not getting support, you're not getting feedback, and you're, you're not um, 
having people help you with your perspective. Um, procrastination, yeah, that's a big one because we all have um, the ability to procrastinate um, at some level, but again, this gets worse um, with the more burnout you are experiencing. So that's something to really watch yourself. If you're you know, going to work and you turn on the computer and you look at the 20 things you need to do and uh, you decide to surf the internet for an hour because you can't even face getting started, that's probably a good sign that procrastination is an issue. Uh, next one is using food and drugs and alcohol to cope. Um, we kind of talked about uh, the food already, but but using drugs and alcohol to cope and to get things done and to feel better, of course, is a, a shortcut to trouble. Um, one thing that's that's worrisome to me that when I first heard about what was going on during the pandemic is that the alcohol sales in Michigan increased 55 percent in the early part of the pandemic, and it's like, well, that's how people are coping, and again, that's probably not the best coping tool in the long run. And hey, Bob, yes, we do have a question here. Yay. <laughs> yeah. So she says a lot of these signs and symptoms pretty closely sound like symptoms of depression. How can we help staff identify the difference? Um, that's a good question. And, and there are various forms of depression. And so it's hard for me to get into that too much. And there is going to be a whole presentation on this with anxiety and depression. So I don't, I, I'm so glad somebody um, asked a question. I'm going to try to pick up on some of that, but there'll be more detail later um, in one of the following presentations. But basically, um, people are still functioning with burnout syndrome. It's a good way to look at it that they may not be functioning as well, but they're still taking care of business and doing what needs to happen, but um, not feeling good about it and maybe not at the level they were before. When you start looking at like a major depressive episode, you'll see a, a drastic change in performance. I mean, from to almost nothing, or even if they're coming to work, if it's severe enough. If somebody had a severe uh, major depressive episode, I mean, they're not even going to come to work anymore. They're just not going to show up. And again, that's, it, it's a total change in functioning. Somebody's functioning pretty well, and then you see a, a marked decrease in functioning. I mean, a, a large decrease, and you can definitely see it, and you can look at when it started and when it ended. Where burnout syndrome People are, are still holding down the fort and still taking care of things, but just not quite at the level they were. I hope that's helpful. Yep, that was helpful. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any questions on signs and symptoms? So now you know what it looks like. And it, it definitely does have a few of the symptoms of depression included. It does, and that's part of that learned helplessness that I talked about. Again, it's a decrease in performance, but not um, let's stop doing anything kind of decrease. It's, it's just a decline in performance, not a no longer perform. Okay, we're gonna go into the causes of burnout at this point. Okay, no surprise, work-related causes of burnout. <laughs> the most important area is probably work-related, right? So um, one thing that adds to employees feeling more burned out is that feeling that they have little or no control over their work. I, I saw an interesting video about um, a hospital in Kentucky, I don't remember what it was called, they were looking at the stress level of employees and how long they would live. And, and the, the CEO had less stress than the janitor. And everyone's going, what do you mean? The CEO has, has to worry about millions of dollars. And the janitor just has to mop stuff up. 
but the janitor would show up each day. He never knew what his day was going to be like or when he would have his work done or what problems occurred that he would have to deal with. And so he had almost no control over his schedule and when he would go home and what would happen. He just showed up to clean up messes or deal with problems wherever he had to. The CEO could control his schedule, could control his meetings, could control his day. So actually the CEO was under less stress than the janitor. So it's important to look at that from a supervisory um, perspective and as an employee, that the more sense of control, locus of control you have, um, the less likely you are to get burned out. And the more we can give people control over their schedules and their days, the less likely they are to experience burnout. So very important piece to think about there. If we feel in control, even if it's a false sense of control, we feel better. Um, another piece is the lack of recognition for good work. Um, that one's not quite as powerful in my book as the one above it. Um, but definitely, if you're working hard and no one cares, I mean, that, that can definitely make you feel that your work is, is not meaningful. Um, overly demanding job expectations um, is a big one. Um, expecting people to put in um, a ton of hours and, and go way beyond what their expectations are is a big problem. Putting people in a position where they don't know what the expectations are can also cause them a lot of grief because a lot of people want to meet your expectations, right? They want to be good employees. They want to be A students. And then you're kind of like, go out and do the job and they don't know what's expected. They don't know how to meet that. So they can't measure themselves. So then they feel out of control. We go back to the first one. So important, I guess, from a supervisory um, position is to give people very clear job expectations and, and a lot of feedback so that they, they can meet those and feel good about where they're at. Um, sometimes doing work that, that doesn't push a person at all or doesn't use their skills or strengths um, can add to the problem. Um, if someone's really capable and you have them just doing the same thing every day and they can do a lot more, um, they can get pretty burned out on their job position. Um, the final one on this slide here is working in a chaotic or high pressure environment. Um, definitely if you're like in management, you're coming in every day and you, you, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what fires are going to be and you don't know when you're going home or if you're going home. Um, that can definitely uh, lead to burnout. We often hear about that in some high pressure situations. I don't, I don't think that one's a surprise to anybody. Bob, I've got a couple more things here on the chat and then questions. Awesome. So uh, thinking in terms of the differences between generations, have there been any studies showing certain age groups experience burnout or experience it more frequently? I'm, I'm unaware of that. But I would think that that studies would show that. That's just my my guess. But um, it's real interesting to me right now that that my generation is like you go to work and you you hit it really hard, and if the boss asks you to work more, you'll work more, and that's just what you do, and that's that's where it's at. And I think some of the uh, generations that are are younger than mine um, want more life balance and have more expectations about what that looks like. And I'm not putting a judgment to that at all. I mean, good work balance is critical to avoid burnout, right? So kind of that, you know, you do whatever your boss says, work, work till you drop, um, seems to be um, leaving our culture. And that's, that's probably, I will put a judgment to it, probably a good thing. Okay, thanks, Bob. Um, and then there's a couple more here. Um, okay. Read on the isolation. I think oftentimes we isolate because our brains and bodies are overstimulated. Continuous adrenaline dumps from excessive workloads with time constraints can put your mind and body in overload. 
Um, Absolutely. Good comment. Yeah. And another comment from experience, I began with anxiety, then isolated. Um, and there were heart palpitations and chest pain, which led to serious helplessness, um, which and substantial depressive episode, which seemed completely related. So, okay. Um, thanks for sharing your experience. Whoever typed that in um, makes sense. And it, it does sound like um, things de definitely started with burnout syndrome. Um, and it, it does have, I mean, when you're in that state long enough, you, you will have definite physical symptoms. And again, they look different for different people, but our bodies respond to stress certain ways. And in burnout syndrome, you are stressed. So it, it makes complete sense. Anything else, Amy, on that? No. Thanks for sharing and thanks for the questions. Okay, so we covered work-related causes. Now, what about lifestyle causes? Um, he here's what we're talking about. Working too much without enough time for socializing or relaxing. Um, it's a balance. And we're, we can work pretty hard, but if we don't take care of our other needs and have a balanced lifestyle, we're setting ourselves up for burnout. Um, lack of close supportive relationships. As I pointed out, isolation is a big piece of, of burnout syndrome. And the more we have close supportive relationships around us, um, the more opportunity we have to talk and to get support. I'll also say that, that we are social animals, we're social beings. And our strength comes in in being emotionally attached to others. It, it literally helps our immune system when we're closely emotionally attached to others. Um, it's, it's amazing how powerful that is. And we tend to kind of not look at that as a society, but there's actually um, a formula. There was a, um, an organization hired to try to come up with a formula to predict how long you live, each individual, how long they would live. And they were working on all kinds of formulas for a long time on like all your relatives, how long they lived and coming up with a formula that would predict. And they finally threw that out. And what they discovered is that it's the number of close, emotionally supportive relationships that you have in your life that better predict how long you're gonna live. We're social animals. Um, that support and relationships is critical to our well-being well and our immune systems. So again, we're, we're more, um, we're, we're stronger and more resilient when we have a lot of close supportive relationships and that can protect you from burnout. And we'll talk more about that towards the end. Another thing that can happen is taking on too many responsibilities without enough help. Again, when you get to the point where you're so overwhelmed and you're gonna fail and you're not gonna meet your own expectations and performance levels, that's when people start getting stressed. When we don't meet our expectations, it's frequently us that stresses ourselves out the most. I mean, if your boss is yelling at you because you didn't meet the expectation, that's stressful. But we frequently disappoint ourselves the most. And so you do have to pay attention to those expectations. Um, not getting enough sleep, um, definitely related. If you're not taking care of yourself and your basic needs, um, you're going to be more susceptible to burnout syndrome. Now let's talk personality traits, because this is a big one. Um, people with perfectionistic tendencies um, are way more likely to, to be burned out because they expect perfection. And in doing so, they have extremely high expectations. And it's really hard to meet extremely high expectations. So it's really, really stressful. I mean, I, I think of um, how many students I've, I've worked with that they're gonna get a 3.9 GPA and they're, they're so upset and stressed out and they don't know how they're gonna handle that or if they're gonna handle that. 
And again, there's, there's very, very high expectations that are causing that person grief, even though they're probably just their own. Also, um, the more pessimistic you are of yourself in the world, the more likely you are to suffer from burnout. Um, it, again, if, if you look at it that you're no good, you're not capable, uh, the world's a large cosmic joke and none of this really matters, um, it, it's hard to get meaning out of, out of your purpose in life and out of your job and, and why you're here. So you get into this whole issue of, of purpose and meaning. And once you don't have that, you, it's really easy to get rolling in the negative there. And again, that's part of, part of burnout syndrome is that you start getting more of a pessimistic negative view of your job and yourself. So it's very related. And then how controlling your personality is. You know, we've talked about needing to feel in control is a major factor, but there are, are personalities that need more control than others. Um, there are personalities that want everything laid out exactly. And there are personalities that, you know, can be spontaneous and everything in between. So take a look at that in yourself. How much do you have to be in control? And in doing so, if you're not willing to delegate or be a team player and you take it all on yourself, you know, your likelihood of experiencing burnout is far higher. So a little self-assessment for each one of you. And then the famous high achieving type A personality, right? I mean, I've, I've got to get everything done. I've got to meet everyone's expectations. I got to get an A, um, hard driving personality. Um, definitely much more of a setup. Laid back people, um, that aren't worried about performance rarely get burnout syndrome because they don't have those expectations. System issues. <clears throat> this is a big one for all of us. Um, first thing to mention is compassion fatigue. Uh, there's a lot of evidence out there in the field that, that if you're in a helping profession, which a lot of folks today are that are in this presentation, that there's something called compassion fatigue and that taking care of others um, definitely can lead to more burnout and that the more you take care of others, if you don't balance that, take care of yourself, you're, you're definitely set up for burnout. Um, I do have some stats here to share with you that I don't know the, the information surrounding it. I would love to, but the state of Michigan sent out uh, turnover rates for retaining mental health professionals in the state. And in 2020, their, their claim here is that 56.5% of the mental health clinicians in the state, and I don't know if that means under their employment or in the CMHs or what they mean there, but that 56.5% of the mental health providers turned over in 2020. Now that's incredible, that's, and that's bad news. Um, even the nursing numbers in Michigan were at 32.4%. So, you know, wow, um, something to think about. And we have to be especially careful with burnout syndrome if our job involves caring for others. Now your work environment um, has a lot to do with this. Um, and the agency culture, if, if your agency um, has a hard driving, high expectation culture, well, obviously you're gonna have more likelihood of getting burnout. Um, larger systems, um, our culture, our societal rules, I mean, in France, they get six weeks vacation, right, by law. Um, our society and, and the culture and the systems that we work within do dictate some of that um, problem with burnout. And then complexity theory, um, what that means is that the more complex our world gets and we feel that complexity, 
and we feel that we're being overwhelmed by that complexity, that it leads to burnout syndrome. So if you feel your life is getting more and more complex, that's part of that pathway to burnout syndrome. Okay, I'm not gonna talk about these much for the sake of time, I'm gonna keep moving. But um, if, if you look at these stats real quick, you know, 75% of workers experienced burnout um, with 40% saying they've experienced it during the pandemic. 67% of workers believe burnout has worsened over the course of the pandemic. 36% of employees said their organization did nothing about burnout. Um, burned out employees are 63% more likely to take a sick day and 2.6 times as likely to be actively seeking a different job. Well, no surprise. So um, these stats just really show the prevalence of burnout, particularly during the pandemic. Okay, I'm gonna move us in to your own self-screening. Now we're not obviously not sharing anybody's score. This is for yourself. Um, it's a 15 item scoring test and you're gonna write down a one for not at all, a two for rarely, three for sometimes, four for often, and five very often. So the higher the score, the more burned out you are. Okay, so I'll read them off. And if you wanna answer, and then you can add them up at the end. But I feel run down and drained of physical or emotional energy. Again, a one is not, is, is you're not experiencing that really. And then a five is, you know, very much. I have negative thoughts about my job. I am harder and less sympathetic with people uh, that then perhaps they deserve. I am easily irritated by small problems or by co my coworkers and team. I feel misunderstood or unappreciated by my coworkers. I feel that I have no one to talk to. I feel that I am achieving less than I should. I feel under an unpleasant level of pressure to succeed. And the last page of that test, I feel I'm not getting what I want out of my job. I feel that I am in the wrong organization or the wrong profession. There goes my tractor sales. I am frustrated with parts of my job. I feel that organizational politics or bureaucracy frustrate my ability to do a good job. I feel that there is more work to do than I practically have the ability to do. I feel that I do not have time to do many of the things that are important to doing a good quality job. I find that I do not have time to plan as much as I would like to. Okay, so add those up and here's the self-test scoring key. I mean, if you're between a 15 and 18, um, you're doing very well. Uh, 19 to 32, um, pretty low risk. Um, unless you have gave yourself some fives, those are some things to look at, but pretty low risk. Um, you start, start really paying attention when you're between 34 and 49 at what you can do. Um, you're probably not, not technically in burnout syndrome, but you're headed that way for sure, especially if you're towards the top of that, that range. But once you get to 50 or over, um, you better take a hard look at it because it's probably already affecting your performance. Um, and, and you know, according to this, do something about it urgently. If you're over 60, um, you definitely need to do something about it like right away. Questions on that? Nope, nothing so far. Okay. 
solutions. Let's jump into that. How do you how do you feel better? What if you scored a 60? What do you do? Right? So this is from a longtime therapist advice. I was asked in a presentation once, well, Bob, you've been working with people. Can you share any gems? And what I tell them is, yeah, I'll share, I'll share a gem, is that that we have to, as human beings, consume experiences and that we get experiences that we don't want, we didn't sign up for, and that are difficult and painful. And that we still have to make sense and meaning. And that's, that's what I mean by consumption. And it's very important that we consume experiences and they don't consume us. Um, hey, I Bob, always, yep, what's that? I've got a question here okay. um, before you get too far down this road about the assessments. Um, someone is wondering if it's available to share and where it came from. Um, I don't know if I have down it. I don't have it available to share. And I'll have to look up where it came from. Okay, it will be in the PowerPoint that gets shared later. Um, Absolutely. Just, yeah. All these will be. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, so just to wrap this part up about consuming experiences instead of being consumed, um, I'd often have um, clients tell me that, you know, during deer season, they'd rather be the deer hunter than the deer. The deer hunter is looking for a favorable, fun experience where the deer is trying to survive. And that, that says a lot about us human beings and where we want to be. And a lot of that really is in resilience. And resilience is part of the answer to, to burnout syndrome. Um, the definition is really our ability to recover or adjust from change or, or generally we speak about things that we interpret negatively from negative experiences. And that we're each born with a certain personality resilience, but we also learn from our environment and from the gifts offered to us from our family and from other social connections. And, and we can improve that score. So resilience is our ability to bounce back from hardship. And yes, our personalities kind of come into the world with a certain amount, but we gain more from our environment and we can practice and improve that. So improving your resilience makes a big difference. Um, and there are different areas that you can do that in. Now, what I will say to you, if you have a high score on the burnout syn um, syndrome questionnaire, you might also have a high score on the resilience questionnaire that would show why you've been able to manage that. The more resilience you have, the more um, adversity you can take basically before there's a decline in your performance. So what are those areas? And, and this is gonna tie in with burnout syndrome. Uh, look at the first one, self-control. The more self-control we have where we can you know, make rational decisions and suspend judgment, keep ourselves together um, and not run off um, in emotional directions in the face of adversity at the start, um, the better we're going to do. And again, you know, people feeling in control helps people not feel burned out. And that includes self-control. Um, your ability to believe in yourself and, and improvise, improvise and be creative all that has a lot to do with your resilience. If you struggle with change, I mean, you can work at trying to accept change and make the best of change. And that's how you adapt. You know, like I've talked about a couple of times in this presentation, the more negative you are about things, then you're not experiencing that optimism. And I'm not talking like Pollyanna optimism. I'm talking about a realistic, healthy output where you expect positive outcomes. Optimism protects us from burnout syndrome. We don't get so cynical. Um, and yes, optimism can be improved in individuals if they work at it. Uh, Self-sufficiency, that's really where um, you believe in your own strengths and ability to take care of things. Um, 
you practice self-acceptance. Um, there, there's some self-confidence there too in your self-sufficiency. So that would help you be more resilient. And then persistence. Um, persistence is a, a huge strength. Um, if you really look at a lot of people that got to where they wanted to be with things, they were persistent. Um, there seems to be um, this desire people have of not having to suffer any hardship or deal with um, any negative interpreted states when um, persistence is taking that on. And even when you meet that adversity and, and you're in a negative situation, you're, you're still working towards those goals and where you want to be. The more persistent you are, again, the less likely you're going to experience burnout. So let's see where you're at with that. Let's do a, a 12 question questionnaire. And it's similar in scoring, but a one is strongly disagree. A two would be a disagree. A three would be neutral. A four would be agree. And a five would be strongly agree. So again, I, on this one, um, it's kind of the opposite. I think the higher the score, the better. And in the burnout syndrome, it was the lower the score, the better. Okay, so I'm going to read them off to you. There's 12, if you can score yourself from one to five. Um, in a difficult spot, I turn it once to what, I, what can be done to put things right. I influence where I can rather than worrying about where I can't influence. I don't take criticism personally. I generally manage to keep things in perspective. I am calm in a crisis. I'm good at finding solutions to problems. I, would, I wouldn't describe myself as an anxious person. I don't tend to avoid conflict. I try to control events rather than being a victim of circumstances. I trust my intuition. I manage my stress levels well. And the last one is I feel confident and secure in my position. Okay, so when you when you add that all up, uh, zero to 37 would be you're developing a level of resilience. 38 to 43, you've got a good established level of resilience that you're working with. A 44 to a 48, you've got a strong level of resilience. And a 49 to 60, uh, you've got life made, I think. Uh, those folks never give up. So again, your level of resilience here will dictate your susceptibility to burnout. Okay, and let's talk about the skills before we run out of time. So here's the social tips. Improve work relationships. As part of a QI um, project where we improved work relationships and got closer with the people we worked with, and I'll tell you, it worked great. Made me appreciate work more and feel more supported. Reach out for that support from people, people at work and people not at work. Reach out to people you trust. Um, stay away from the negative people at work. Sometimes um, there'll be a group that's getting really negative and most workplaces have that or people that are really burned out, they'll wanna pull you into the burnout. So avoid those interactions. Um, keep it optimistic and don't get pulled in that negativity because it's going to hurt you. Um, change your thinking about work. Try to find that value. You know, talk to your supervisor. Try to find things you do that you think are important and valuable and worth your time. Make sure you balance things in your life, like hobbies, family, other relationships, travel. It helps us with a wider perspective. The broader our perspective on life, the less we, we get burned out at work. Take time off, do fun things. 
expand that perspective. Reevaluate your priorities, set boundaries with work. Sometimes you have to. Um, take daily breaks from technology. If you have your phone on you all the time and you have your work email and it's chiming at you all night and all weekend, probably not a good idea. Nourish your creative side. Do creative pursuits, things that you as a person enjoys. Set aside relaxation time where you're not going to be on the clock and you're not going to be doing work stuff and you're not going to be answering emails. Make sure you get your rest, get plenty of sleep because that's how we recharge. Make exercise a priority. Um, I can tell you from my experience, um, exercise is extremely helpful. People that, that exercise, you know, two, three times a week, um, really get a benefit here and a change of perspective and all the benefits of exercising. So this can really help protect you from burnout right here. Now, and it's almost a mindfulness activity, right? If you're out doing something cardio, you can't think about work anyway, because you're trying to breathe. Um, healthy diet and of course, moderation of substances. Using mood altering substances is not gonna help you in the long run. Okay, so questions, we're at 159. Questions that Amy can read off to me. I've got nothing at, oh, one just came in. Um, give me a second, I need to move things around here. Um, I think it would be excellent to see employers encourage these, especially when they see that their staff is stressed. Staff should be encouraged to set boundaries, not feel guilty about doing so. Absolutely. And, and remember that, that, yeah, there's personality issues and other things that occur that people can, um, it can cause themselves problems with burnout for sure. But it's really, if we're trying to stay away from burnout, we got to look at it from a societal um, a systems, uh, an agency, an individual. I mean, all those tie into your, your likelihood of experiencing burnout syndrome. And if that's the key takeaway, that's the key takeaway. And then we've got another question. How can supervisors help reduce employee burnout syndrome? And then another one just came in as well. Um, I think, um, some of the things that we were talking about, if you look at kind of the opposite of, um, I'll see if I can pull up the slide here. If you look at, at some of the things that cause burnout, um, and pulled that slide up for you, give, give employees control over their, their work environment, right? As much as you possibly can, because people feeling in control aren't gonna experience so much of this. Um, give recognition and rewards for good work make um, job expectations and what you're looking for very clear and have it be written down and give feedback. Um, make sure people are, are challenged in a good way, but not overwhelmed and have a predictable environment work. If it's chaotic and high pressure and unpredictable, that adds stress to an individual. So I would, I would start right with this slide as far as making differences. Thanks. And we've got another comment here. It says, not a question, but I've been listening to the book, Burnout, The Secret to Unlocking the Stress Cycle. Might be a good resource to recommend. Inter awesome. Interestingly, exercise is shared as the number one priority to help move through the stress cycle and reduce burnout biologically. Well, thank you for sharing that title. And that's good reading for everybody. And in my personal experience, I would agree. Exercise is super important for reducing uh, the likelihood of, of having burnout syndrome. Are there other questions, Amy? Um, nope, we've got one way to go, Bob. <laughs> thank you, whoever said that. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Bob and Amy, for joining us today for the webinar. That was amazing. Um, I learned so much. Glad to hear it. This was so good. I'm really looking forward to the rest of the sessions um, coming up throughout the year. So if I remember correctly, our next one, I believe, will be in June. Um, 
Yes. So we'll be back in June with another webinar on um, a mental wellness topic. And we will send the recording and the slides out later this afternoon or tomorrow, as well as the evaluation. So don't forget to take your evaluation. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. This was a phenomenal opportunity. Bob, would you like to say anything before we end the webinar? Just thank you. And I, I appreciate everyone coming and, and listening to what I had to say. And have a good afternoon. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you.